And now it's time for us to discuss more of these headlines and simple keywords with Adam joining us via Zoom. I think we have you on the line. I'll get a visual on you in just a moment. <laughs> Good morning, Adam. <laughs> Good. Uh- Good morning. I mean, I can see what's going on there quite well. I don't know uh, what the issue is. Give but, us a uh, second. Yeah, Give I'm, us a second. I'm, I'm having a studio tour at the moment, and it's uh, very interesting. I'm, I'm getting a uh, glimpse of what's happening live over there. It's very active. You know, see, this is all mood because none of our listeners had that visual, so they're just they're ah. just they just think we're speaking nonsense. Good morning, Adam. Okay. Good morning. I got the exclusive then. <laughs> all right. Let's jump into our keyword news portion of the day. We're going to try to clarify these major headlines lines for our local listeners and this is our first pick of the day democracy summit host so the leaders of south korea and the united states say that president yoon will host the next and third summit for democracy which will likely be held next year what's the latest adam Right, so President Yoon and Joe Biden made the announcement in a joint statement. It highlighted the two countries' shared bonds and values and solves growing global leadership as reasons why it's hosting the next one. Now, it added that they are committed to further strengthening what they called robust political, economic, security and people-to-people ties. The statement also said that Korea's uh, democratic institutions are a beacon of strength in the Indo-Pacific. And the two leaders also said they are proud to continue their work together to ensure that the momentum built by the first two summits for democracy will continue uh, into the future. Now, Yoon is co-hosting the second democracy summit with the leaders of the US, uh, Costa Rica, the Netherlands and Zambia, um, which is currently underway for two days. You led the first plenary session uh, under the theme democracy, delivering economic growth and shared prosperity and highlighted Korea's role as a defender of democracy. Mm -hmm. And in his opening remarks, he said the world is facing various crises and challenges. He noted that geopolitical conflicts and competing interests have greatly uh, reduced multilateral cooperation. And he added that fake democracy represented by anti-intellectualism is on the rise around the world. And he describes um, the development process of Korea as having been a constant journey toward freedom. Mm. And he added that efforts to preserve freedom are still ongoing. And he called for the restoring of democracy through innovation and solidarity. Um, Meanwhile, on the second day of the summit uh, on Thursday, Korea is hosting an Indo-Pacific regional session. It will focus on international cooperation for anti-corruption, as well as financial transparency and integrity, uh, non-governmental stakeholders, as mm-hmm. well as technology. It's it's funny because uh, we would assume from a distance dem- democracy is a finite idea, but it's not, and it's constantly evolving too. And uh, this summit seems to highlight those points. Um, there's still more work to be done, and mm-hmm. a joint communique, uh, basically implying that they are in it together to defend a democracy at large. So we'll leave it there for now because that's a large framework at work. We'll move on to our second keyword of the day. Boosting spending. Finance Minister Chu Gyeong-ho has unveiled 60 billion won worth of support measures aimed at boosting tourism and consumption. Uh, let's start off with the tourism side. Yeah, so quite a bit to go through here, but I'll just try and <laughs> run through it as quickly as I can uh, and in as less detail as I can or summarize in more simple to understand terms. Now, the government plans to inject uh, basically, 40 billion won through subsidizing major discount events for hotels and attractions to uh, promote tourism. It'll also allocate 20 billion won to finance travel expenses for, say, SME employees and store owners. Uh, foreigners from 22 countries, including Japan, Singapore, and the US, will temporarily be allowed to enter Korea without applying for what's known as the Korea Electronic Travel Authorization, or KETA for short. Now, This is a requirement for travelers coming from visa-free countries. Uh, The countries are selected based on the number of travelers flying to Korea and the low rate of people denied entry. Mm -hmm. Now, the temporary lifting of this KETA will be implemented through next year. Uh, The visa-free system applied to travelers with layovers in Korea will be resumed starting uh, next month. Uh, Transit travelers will be allowed to stay in Korea for up to 30 days. Um, The government also plans to ease regulations for what's known as e-group visas for people uh, from Vietnam, the Philippines and Indonesia. Uh, Currently, e-group visas are only issued to tourists that are on group tours that their employers have paid for or 
for school trips of five or more people. Um, the government plans to lower the number of required people in the tour group to three as well. Mm. Uh, there are also discount programs uh, for um, various hotels and online reservations for selected attractions. Um, Tourism-related transportation discounts uh, include a maximum of 50% off on, say, KTX trains uh, that are sold alongside local tourism programs. And there's also a maximum 20,001 discount on airplane tickets for domestic travel um, as well. Now, uh, to attract visitors for longer periods, there's something known as a digital nomad vis <laughs> uh, visa and K-culture visa um, as well. Now, the digital nomad visa is basically targeting those who want to stay in Korea uh, for a year or even two without any economic activity in the country, hence the name Nomad. They're just roaming around, I guess, <laughs> in the country uh, for a year or two. Uh, the K-Culture visa will target young foreigners with a strong interest in Korean culture uh, who basically plan to enroll in uh, related educational institutions, so basically young people who want to learn more mm -hmm. um, about Korean culture. It will be granted to uh, for a maximum of 90 days and will be offered from June uh, no timeline was actually revealed for the digital uh, nomad visa, but there you have it. That, that's for boosting tourism. Okay, boosting tourism and to attract more, not just tourists, but foreigners of all kinds, I mean, right? I mean, the digital mm -hmm. nomad visa seems to do something different, a long-term stay with an easier process. Now, what about ways to boost domestic spending? Yeah, so this, this kind of ties into the tourism mm -hmm. measures as well, because, of course, if you boost tourism, then you boost spending in the country as well. But in terms of uh, the local kind of measures, major consumer discount events uh, will basically be extended. This includes extending the days of the Korea Sales Festa. That's usually held in November from 15 days to 20. Uh, the government plans to offer discount events for major Korean agricultural, livestock and fishery products uh, as well that are equivalent to 17 billion won. This, of course, comes amid high inflation and consumer prices and prices of food products uh, being at record highs. Major retailers will also uh, offer up to 20% discounts. Traditional markets will offer discounts of up to 30% uh, with the help of the government. Uh, and all these measures basically come as President Yoon has been instructing the government to draw up measures to boost domestic consumption uh, to help revive the economy. All right, uh, we'll leave it there so we can move on to our third uh, keyword of the day. Rice veto. <laughs> that's, that's pretty clever. Uh, Prime Minister Han Duxu is advising the president to veto a contentious legislation which was passed by the opposition party unilaterally requiring the government to purchase excess rice. Now, of course, many economists have chimed in uh, questioning the long-term effects. What this be sustainable is a big question. So what's the latest, Adam? Right, so this all comes amid a kind of trend that Korean people are consuming less rice. So right. there's obviously excess co uh, uh, that's being produced. Uh, this bill was railroaded by the Democratic Party last week and it has been met with fierce uh, protests from both the government and the ruling party. Now, Prime Minister Han said the bill forces the government to purchase all of its excessively produced rice regardless of how much people consume. He added that such a law does not help either the farmers or the development of agriculture. And he noted that the government has repeatedly explained the problem and the side effects of the bill. He said the government is willing to spend 10 trillion won or even 20 trillion won if that could save the local farms. But he noted that wasn't the way. And he cited that Korea's rice industry is in a state of excessive production and unstable prices. He warned that the recently passed bill will only drive local farms into a deeper crisis, describing the legislation as populist policy. Now, the bill itself requires the government to purchase rice if the oversupply exceeds 3 and 5% of the expected demand or if rice prices fall more than 5 to 8% on year. Uh, the government and the PPP, the People Power Party, say the government's mandatory purchase will only weaken the incentive to innovate or increase rice's competitiveness. Mm. Uh, they have argued that farms and related companies basically need to consider using rice for, say, other purposes, mm. including for processed goods, for example, as consumption um, has been shrinking. So basically trying to find ways to use rice in other uh, ways uh, mm. because there is an excess there. So another contentious issue um, that could have a lot of uh, repercussions uh, for the Korea's um, staple food. 
Korean rice wine is stepping out of soju's shadows. Um, can excess yeah. rice be utilized elsewhere? I mean, again, these questions come down to not just simple numbers, but complex questions with less mm. demand for rice overall. How do we utilize it? And how do we mm. ensure that 5, 10, 20 years down the road, it is still sustainable? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if there's more rice wine products out there because of the excess, uh, that's more welcome news for me personally. So (laughs) that's a hopeful prospect. (laughs) All right, let's move on to our fourth keyword of the day. Endemic roadmap. With COVID-19 cases subsiding and related restrictions being eased, the government has announced a roadmap to eventually redefine COVID-19 as an endemic. Can you tell us the details? Yeah, so basically we're seeing this trend of going more towards this pre-pandemic or normalization of uh, life, basically. And the country will move toward uh, pre-pandemic normality uh, in three phases, or that's the aim anyway. In phase one, the government will downgrade the classification of the virus to alert from the current serious and also shorten the mandatory isolation period from five days from the uh, to five days from the current seven Uh, In phase two, the remaining mandatory mask rules and isolation mandate for virus patients will be lifted. In phase three, COVID-19 will basically eventually become endemic, meaning its presence becomes more predictable and manageable, like the flu. Uh, Prime Minister Handok Su said each ministry and local government will need to preemptively prepare for necessary measures, uh, such as revisions of related guidelines, Mm -hmm. and inform the public of them. Uh, Health authorities expect Korea to be able to enter phase one in late April, so not that long away, about a month's time, or early May, when the World Health Organization plans to discuss whether to declare an end to what it calls a public health emergency of international concern regarding COVID-19. The authorities said most of the quarantine and medical measures uh, related to COVID-19 will be maintained in phase one. Mm. Um, Now, in phase two, most of the quarantine measures will be lifted uh, as the remaining mask requirements and isolation mandate for virus patients will be changed to recommendations. Uh, The government will close, for example, its COVID-19 testing centres and discontinue its support for the costs of testing and sick leave. The range of support for medical treatments will be narrowed as well to basically critically ill patients. Uh, The government also stopped counting the number of newly confirmed cases as well. Uh, uh, In phase three, practically all quarantine and medical measures um, will be lifted. Vaccinations, for example, will belong to the National Vaccination Program. Mm. Uh, The government also stopped covering the cost of COVID-19 medicines, such as Paxlovid and Considering that such medications are expensive, the government will push for the national health insurance to be uh, applied to them. So basically, COVID-19 is slowly going to be turned into uh, a kind of your um, uh, like a flu virus. It's like a treated mm. as uh, the seasonal influenza mm. uh, and won't be considered as harsh, as serious as it has been during the height of the pandemic. All right. So seeing it as more manageable and perhaps requiring a yearly shot, just like the influenza, as you mentioned. Mm. All right. Let's move on to our final keyword of the day. Security aides resigns. And so we have a new national security advisor. President Yunus tapped Seoul's ambassador to the U.S. as his new national security advisor following the resignation of his current advisor. Do we have more context as to what exactly happened? We sure do. Well, uh, just to get the um, details out of the way, Cho Taeyang was named uh, as the new national security advisor. That came after Kim Sun-an stepped down from the post yesterday, in fact. So after a very short while. Now, why is this newsworthy? We've seen a lot of personnel reshuffles, but mm. why is this making headlines? It's because Kim's resignation uh, comes just less than a month until President Yoon's uh, state visit to the U.S. and that very um, uh, anticipated summit with Joe Biden, especially in line with all these issues that are happening between the two countries and the allies. It's uh, come at a bit of an unusual time. Now, the move follows media speculation that Seoul's top security official would soon be replaced over confusion in handling the president's diplomatic activities. This basically followed the surprise uh, resignations of protocol and foreign affairs secretaries earlier this month. Um, So this has led to speculation that are there some internal problems arising Mm -hmm. in terms of uh, U.S. diplomatic 
uh, policies. That's a speculation. Now, Choi is one of the diplomatic experts who actually helped map out the foreign policy platform for Yoon's presidential election campaign last year. He has served as Yoon's first ambassador to the US since last year, and he's a career diplomat with nearly 30 years of experience, and he's an expert on Korea-US ties and North Korean nuclear issues, and he's worked uh, the previous Park Geun-hye administration as well. He is actually now in Seoul to attend an annual meeting of South Korean chiefs of overseas diplomatic missions. And uh, the top office says he will start moving into his new position uh, mm-hmm. immediately. So, of course, that leaves the position of top envoy to the U.S. vacant. So mm-hmm. eyes will be, of course, on what uh, who will be taking that role. Thank you very much, Adam, for today's coverage. We'll see you tomorrow. Have a safe day. See you tomorrow. If you're listening to our program using the podcast service, just a reminder that we do go live Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. Korea Standard Time. So tune in and help us make the show more informative by giving us your input. See you bright and early on Good Morning Seoul.